So uh, when we recruited speakers, I had the task of recruiting half the speakers for the institute, and we had a few criteria. Uh, one of which was content knowledge. We carved up the ancient world, the Middle East and North Africa into different topics, and we said, who is an expert on this topic? But then we had to filter it. Because as you know, not every expert is always a great a communicator, a great educator. So then we said, okay, who's also a good teacher? And so our list got narrower and narrower. And then I, for the first talk, I not only had those two criteria, I needed someone to start us off with a bang. So this is quite challenging. Uh, but I think we have very strongly succeeded. I'm very excited about our first speaker today, uh, Professor Kenneth Harl. I'm going to introduce him. Um, so Professor Harl is a professor of classical and Byzantine history at Tulane University in New Orleans, where he teaches on a variety of topics, uh, Greek and Roman history, Byzantine history, Crusader history. One of the reasons we picked him in particular was he teaches just about everything. Um, in fact, he has recently completed a course. Uh, who's heard of the teaching company? I see a few hands. I think it's possible, from my own private research, that Professor Harl is the most widely published teacher of the teaching company, with 11 courses done so far. Um, and if you've never heard of the teaching company, it's basically a, a remarkable uh, service. They basically record professors. They call the best college lecturers in the country. They scout out. They look for high, highly rated teachers. They record courses in 30-minute segments you can listen to on your drive to work. And Professor Harlson just about everything, which means that he's a great person to think about how the ancient world fits into the world history more broadly. Uh, who's a world history teacher? So I saw a lot of hands go up. Um, to continue, um, he's also an extraordinary teacher. Uh, he's won the Student Body Teaching Award nine times, uh, which I thought was pretty remarkable, as well as, as well as Baylor University's nationwide award for great teachers. Uh, so uh, we have a great professor amongst us. He's also an archaeological work in Turkey. Um, uh, he's an expert in numismatics, uh, coins. He works a lot on, uh, he has a new book coming out on Rome and her Iranian foes. So he works not just in the Greco-Roman world we often think about is sort of located in the Italian, you know, the, the peninsula there or the, in Greece, but also uh, in Iran and Turkey. And I'm just going to plug a few of his teaching company courses. Origins of Great Ancient Civilization, Barbarian Empires of the Steppes, Roman the Barbarians, Great Ancient Civilizations of Asia Minor. Please join me in welcoming a wonderful first speaker. I'm just going to wire you up. Yeah, put the pressure on. <laughs> OK, so you can put it in your, in your yeah, pocket. Um, I think the easiest thing is in here. And then you can clip it right up here. Okay. That's how we usually do it. Okay. I'm a trainable primate. I've done this many times with the teaching company. Oh, can we, uh, is that, that's just the part. It didn't come out of the... Yeah, let me get that out of the way in my pocket. Okay. Try. Well, I thank uh, Sam Ross for that very kind introduction. It was so kind, I don't even recognize myself from the description. Um, and I hope that I can give you an introduction to the ancient world, which will be useful to you. Uh, I will be here until, I guess, the 7th. I, I then have to leave uh, at noon. Uh, please feel free to follow up with questions and talk to me. Uh, I have not been able to, to cover all of the civilizations, particularly the later ones east of the Euphrates, as I like to call them, but I'm open to any kind of questions on the ancient or the medieval world. And if you have concerns about something like Sassanid Persia or Kushans, uh, which I won't cover in this lecture, uh, feel free to bring those up with me and I'll be able to give you bibliography and suggestions. Uh, what I'm doing today is a orientation of the ancient world as is traditionally taught in American colleges and universities. I've taught a course many years called Ancient Near Eastern Greece. And I'm not sure how everyone is familiar with it, but what I want to do is orient you on how to understand the ancient world and perhaps integrate it into world history or other types of courses you might be giving. So think of this and myself as a useful resource, a disposable resource, uh, which you can make uh, use of. Uh, in organizing ancient history, it's a kind of daunting task. Uh, most of my colleagues colleagues now are quite the modernists. Uh, anything before 1900 is vaguely ancient in their mind. And when they ask me to teach uh, the ancient world, they have very little understanding of what the uh, amount of time and space is. But to give you an orientation, uh, now research has, has really pushed back the Neolithic period to uh, at least around 9,000, 10,000 BC when you get serious domestication of animals. And uh, the most impressive site, Gebekli Tepe, shows the earliest monumental architecture. And we've often uh, called that now the aceramic Neolithic. That is the beginning of farming and domestication of animals. And this occurs 
in the Middle East, uh, which I prefer to call the Near East, but it's become the Middle East since 1945. That's another story. And it's actually occurred in the, in the area where my wife was born and grew up. And I often suspect that uh, my wife has DNA that goes back to these early farmers and monumental uh, builders. Uh, it then moves into the Neolithic period, Shatahuyuk, uh, which means Fork Hill in Turkish, uh, one of the best documented early farming communities. Uh, Chalcolithic refers again to the um, uh, introduction of copper, uh, comes from the Greek kalkos and lithos together, and that represents another stage. And then you go into the Bronze Age, which sees the developments of a um, three major river valley civilizations urban literate civilizations, which many of you may be familiar with. I'll talk a bit about Egypt, Sumar, and Malua, or the Indus Valley. Uh, this leads to the development of a great Bronze Age order uh, from 1500 to about 1220 BC, uh, an imperial order. Uh, there's been a good deal of scholarship on the communication among the great powers at the time uh, in the Near East. That would include Egypt, uh, the Kassites of Babylon, the Mitanni, uh, especially the Hittite Empire, near and dear to me in Asia Minor, and the early Mycenaean or Achaean kingdoms of Greece. Uh, this represented the pinnacle of developments going all the way back to the A ceramic period where uh, increasing uh, sophistication in agriculture, development of trade, development of literacy in cities are able to sustain these great imperial orders. This order collapses. There's still a lot of speculation why, various explanations why this order breaks up. I'll talk about it in a bit more detail uh, in the uh, substance of the lecture. And this represents a major break of the Bronze Age. And there are many scholars who study the Bronze Age or the origins of civilization. And then there's a lot of scholars who study the post-Bronze Age. We often call it Iron Age, when iron comes into general use, and uh, alphabetic writing. And that is usually dated somewhere around 1900 BC. And that sees the development of the classical civilizations in which I was originally trained. That would include Hellenic and Greek, eventually the Roman Empire, and then the breakup of the Roman Empire, which is in a way the summation of these uh, civilizations, in another major break. So you have these two breaks, one at the end of the Bronze Age, one in the 5th and 6th centuries, which sees the Roman cultural order evolve into what is essentially Western Europe, Eastern Europe centered on the Byzantine Empire in Constantinople, and then an Islamic civilization which is on the southern shores of, North of the Mediterranean, North Africa, and the eastern provinces of the Roman world in Iran. And so you get this uh, division of civilizations which still obtains today. The, the only major change in that uh, new order that emerges in the 7th and 8th century is that Spain eventually goes back Christian, what becomes Turkey goes Islamic. And that's a major change of the 14th and 15th century, which is a little outside the scope of this talk. Um, in looking at the origins of Bronze Age civilization, uh, there has been exciting work done, uh, primarily by American scholars who are anthropologists in training and a crazy group of people. They are really quite uh, remarkable uh, scholars who have been excavating in what is now Eastern Turkey. Uh, they have pushed back the dates of the domestication of animals and plants considerably. They have undermined a, a, a very common argument that would have been made, say, post-1945, that there was a Neolithic revolution. That is, the population got to a point where it had to invent farming or it would starve. And actually, that, that notion was... Um, uh, pioneered by uh, scholars writing in the 40s and 50s, has essentially been discarded. And what you see is a much more gradual evolution and experimentation with animals. And as Michael Rosenberg, who was one of the fellows working out there, has uh, demonstrated, the first animal probably domesticated for food was the pig. Uh, Michael always loves to point that out. Um, there was articles run in the New York Times, nice Jewish boy determines pig first animal on the menu. He loves handing these out. Um, and um, he, as well as a whole group of teams, have, have been working out here the origins of metallurgy, uh, the movement to the first ceramics, and the most spectacular site um, which had been anticipated, that was recovered about four or five years ago and made it on the tourist trade, 
uh, uh, is Gebekli Tepe, uh, which is a stunning site in southeastern Turkey, which is the first monumental architecture in the world. Um, this is the excavation as it looked several years ago. I have not been back since the disturbances in southeastern Turkey with fighting between the Kurds and the Turkish army. And I, I shudder to think what's going on in Turkey right now. My, uh, my wife is there with her family visiting. And it is a, um, clearly a sanctuary built by people who had pooled their labor together uh, to set up these great monoliths, and the reconstruction of it is, uh, it looks eerily similar to Stonehenge in some ways, except it's about, uh, anyone familiar with Stone Age, it's well over 6,000 years earlier. Uh, you have a dromos running in here, uh, a set of monoliths with marvelous carvings, uh, the upper levels, and when you're at the site, you can actually stand up and look in. Uh, clearly, this is for ceremonies. You'd have to ascend uh, in ladders uh, to perform whatever's going on. And the site uh, is also some distance from any water source, as far as we can tell. And so this represents an enormous pooling of resources by people who are in the early stages of um, domesticating animals and plants and are still largely what we would call hunter-gatherers. Uh, there are several other sites that we suspect had similar architecture. Unfortunately, one of them was washed away by the Ataturk uh, Euphrates Dam project. Uh, other, others are under, underway, uh, but this is in exactly the area where wheat was first domesticated. The wheat, the uh, icorn uh, strand, which is the ancestor of domestic wheat uh, in, in the world today. Uh, here are some of the examples of the carvings that have come down to us, uh, again with uh, flint tools. And it represents the first stage on the way up in the Middle East leading to cities. The next site is some um, 4,000 years later, and that evolves to uh, a site known as Chateau Huyuk. Uh, here it is from an aerial photography. There's two excavations. Uh, one here, the original excavation in the 1960s, done by uh, Jimmy Mellart, who was one of the most talented archaeologists uh, in um, Turkey at the time, and has often been hailed as the British equivalent of Schliemann. Uh, and that has more to do not only with his genius as an archaeologist, but some of his controversial activities afterwards. Uh, the new excavations are at this end, being uh, directed by Ian um, Hodder. And together, what they have shown is a site that has evolved into a permanent settlement where the balance has shifted from uh, there's still hunting and gathering and fishing going on, uh, but it has shifted decidedly towards agriculture as your prime uh, food resource. Uh, there's also uh, uh, an incredible industry going on in making tools. This is a reconstruction of what the city, uh, the village's um, houses must have looked like. And you've now shifted to sites with hundreds of residents and certain specializations of labor. Uh, it also uh, shows, this is a very controversial wall painting, it also shows what we think is the first depiction of a city consciously. We, there, there's a lot of debate what this represents. This is today in the Museum of Anatolian Civilizations. It's a fresco from one of the um, houses, but it seems to represent the pattern of cities here, which I showed you in the isometric reconstruction, in the lower level, and in the back is Hassan Da, which is the great mountain, volcanic mountain, which has uh, fertilized the plain. Uh, it clearly is also the source of the obsidian, uh, which is turned into tools and weapons and traded across the Near East. And this is in a series of transactions where Group A trades with B, B then takes it and trades it to C, and they can travel great distances. It doesn't mean the people who made the tools travel to the final destination, but a series of transactions move these uh, tools uh, across the Near East and brought prosperity to this site. It is also an important site because we have some of our first indications of um, religion, uh, much, much more evident than what we saw at Gebekli Tepe, which were uh, animal depictions. Uh, there are various representations of the bull and hunting scenes. Some of them may remind you of the uh, paintings at Lascaux in, in um, southern France. And of course, our earliest depiction of a mother goddess, a small figurine, and both figures will be 
reinvented and reinterpreted, especially in Asia Minor in Turkey, right down to the Roman period. The mother goddess associated with fe felines, uh, these look like um, leopards actually, based on their spots, and then a bull figure, uh, a, a bull who is the vehicle or the symbol of the sky god, uh, Zeus, as he would be called in the Greek tradition, Teshub in the Hurrian uh, Hittite tradition, and that religious symbol persists well into the Roman Empire. From these um, um, advances, uh, Gebekli Tepe is in um, this area here, uh, Shatahuyuk is here on the uh, Konya Plain in Turkey. Uh, these um, uh, settlements see a shift down to the river valleys, both in the Nile and the Tigris and Euphrates, and I believe one of the speakers may be speaking much more on Egypt and the origins of civilization in Northeast Africa. Uh, but between about 4500 and 3500 BC, the river valleys come under cultivation. Uh, that requires enormous amount of mobilization and labor on an order that you had not seen at Chateau Hoyek. So when you're looking at how did we get cities, you start with Gebekli Tepe, you move to Chateau Hoyek, and you end up with the early cities of Uruk and Ur in Sumar, in lower Iraq today. And very quickly, a unification of the villages in Egypt into the first Egyptian kingdom uh, by the pharaohs of Dynasty I. Uh, these civilizations uh, can be broken into, uh, these river valley civilizations, uh, into a chronology. I've tried to simplify it to give you an idea of what that chronology looks like in the Bronze Age. By 3500 BC, cities and the beginning of writing appears in Lower Iraq. As far as we can tell, that is the earliest writing we know of anywhere. Um, the Sumerians, the people who invent this, uh, spoke a language related to no language today. Uh, we have no uh, connection and the only reason we know of it is the fact that it was later retained as a religious language and you have various dictionaries and grammars in Akkadian, a Semitic language related to Hebrew and Arabic which we can read and that allows us to break the Sumerian language and they're still working on it in some ways. The grammars and syntax is, is quite different. What it is is it is agglutinative. Uh, uh, does anyone know Turkish by any chance as a language? It's, it's a stick together language where you do everything with suffixes or prefixes. Um, Turkish is that very, very much that way, but it's not related to Turkish. Um, and this uh, writing system then allows for the um, uh, uh, some, uh, amassing of resources, uh, at, sees the development of city states that struggle for primacy of lower Iraq. Uh, the NC and Lugals, and what you want is control of the irrigation systems and the trade routes. Uh, that's what they fight over. Uh, and eventually, you see the cities, states, coalesce into the first territorial empires. The Akkadian under Sargon lasts about a century. A second one under the dynasts of U Ur lasts a century. And the final one, well known to people, uh, the Amorite uh, Empire Babylon of Hammurabi. These territorial states build upon the institutions of the city-states. They see the emergence of bureaucracies and royal armies which become essential to the running of imperial orders in the Middle East today. And in many ways, the, um, the later um, incarnations of these imperial orders going all the way down to the Ottoman Empire look back to Hammurabi. They're also very much uh, linked to the association of the ruler with law. Uh, as a gift of the gods and the importance of the ruler uh, uh, providing law for his subjects. So when you look at Mesopotamia, you're, you're moving from cities and literacy uh, to warring states to territorial empires and the emergence of a Near Eastern monarchy, a Near Eastern monarchy which ultimately will influence developments down to today. Um, the Babylonian Empire breaks up and there's a period in the late Bronze Age where what is today Iraq or Mesopotamia is essentially divided up between foreign rulers, the Kassites and the Mitanni. Um, that's a snapshot of what I teach usually in Mesopotamian history. 
it very, very much depended on the irrigation systems. Uh, all of this uh, for providing the densities and populations that could support cities of now 20 to 25,000 people, as opposed to villages of maybe 500 to 1,000. It's a whole different change in order of magnitude. Uh, in Sumerian myth, uh, the god Ninurta, who is the god of war, is also the god of the canals and irrigation. In the earliest accounts we have of the rulers of these early city-states, they go by the term Ensi. If they're more prominent, they use the name Lugal, big man. They will emphasize their irrigation projects and the bringing of fertility to land as much as conquest and battle. That's how important uh, the system is. Um, here is one of the earliest uh, plannings we have from, this is from the, um, uh, the later Babylonian period, showing uh, a master plan of um, canals and irrigation system, uh, uh, neatly organized and regulated. And with that, you could collect taxes, you could collect surpluses, you could support your bureaucracy and army. And of course, uh, incredible building programs. Uh, this is the rebuilt temple of Sin, or Nana, as he's known in Sumerian, the moon god of the third dynasty of Ur. And by the way, during the, um, uh, the Iraq war with Saddam Hussein, this is where he parked his airplanes in and around this um, temple because he knew it wouldn't be bombed. It is uh, uh, a rebuilding of a much earlier temple complex going back at least to 3500 BC. Give you an idea of the reconstruction of what uh, a city looked like, the product of all of this uh, from the city of Ur with its canal systems and its density of population. Cities like this needed trade and they're sustained by um, a complex system of trade routes. And in the process of expanding from about 2000 BC to 1500 BC, urban literate civilization moves out of the river valleys of lower Iraq to the wider Near East, to northern Iraq, to southeastern Tur uh, Iran, into Anatolia, that is the heartland of Turkey today, the Levant, that would today be represented by Syria, uh, by Jordan, by Israel, and by Lebanon. All of those areas come under the influence of the urban elite, uh, illiterate civilizations of lower Mesopotamia. Uh, the writing systems, uh, here is an example of the full-blown cuneiform system from Babylon and a letter from Kultepe, which is a merchant community of Assyrians, people from Mesopotamia, in what is now Turkey, bringing writing to um, that region uh, because they set up a karum or trade community in order to facilitate trade from Turkey, from Central Asia Minor, to um, the river valley cities of Nineveh and Ashur, that is the cities of um, uh, northern Iraq. Uh, if anyone is familiar with um, living in river valleys, I'm just curious, is anyone from the New Orleans area or southern Louisiana? It's muck. <laughs> Uh, man is trying to draw a division between earth and water that doesn't exist. I can say that even before Hurricane Katrina, I've, having lived there many years. And the, uh, there are no ge geologists in New Orleans because there's no rocks to study. Uh, and the result is when you live in river valleys and you build cities like this, the river valley gives you an enormous amount of abundance, but it also exacts a very high toll in death rates, eye diseases, uh, fevers. So there's a constant need to replenish the population by bringing in newcomers. It also lacks many important items in a higher level civilization, such as metals, uh, wood, uh, stone. All of this has to be imported. So by the um, creation of cities, in the river valleys, you have generated long distance trade, which becomes a significant part of sustaining these urban civilizations. And to record and understand that trade, writing is invented. It's not invented to write great poetry. It's not invented to write history. It's essentially invented to keep records. And the earliest writing system was exactly that. And in time, it, it evolved into the kind of high literature we associate with writing today. And that was a process that occurred between 3500 and 2800 BC in Sumer. It's roughly contemporary in Egypt, although that's a very contentious issue as to how the hieroglyphs turned into a writing system. It seems to be somewhat later than Sumar, and there's a debate whether it's independent or the idea of writing was influenced from Sumar. I've come out 
thinking about it on both sides of the issue, I don't know what I believe anymore. It's, 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 it's difficult to tell because of the nature of Egyptian archaeology. Um, in any case, um, the writing system uh, also sets a standard, which I always tell my students why they're uh, learning all this stuff. Um, the Sumerians set the standard that he who knows how to write and research runs the civilization and everyone else does the grunt work. And you should um, use that with your students when they're asking, why do I need to learn this? Well, the rules haven't changed. Not since the Sumerians set them. Literacy is the passport to advancement. It also sees the emergence of uh, powerful monarchies. Uh, I give an example of Sargon, the first conqueror we know of and Hammurabi, who stands at the end of those early uh, territorial empires. And this is uh, his great stele in the Louvre, uh, which are his 200 and something like 62 laws, if I remember correctly, uh, which are recorded uh, to act as a system for uh, royal officials to adjudicate cases. This is uh, the first law code uh, that has come down to us intact. There are clearly earlier ones that we've uh, found in fragments, but this one is the culmination of a long legal tradition, and it was written in the spoken language at the time, Akkadian. It was not an academic exercise. It clearly was intended to be used. Uh, Egypt is the other river valley civilization. Its agricultural developments and origins of hieroglyphics go back to about the same time. You see the development of writings and cities in, in lower Mesopotamia. Uh, the Egyptians, uh, the ancestors of the Egyptians have been in the Nile Valley for a very long time. Probably moving in there as early as 7000 BC as the Sahara started to dry up. And uh, you see um, evolution to more sophisticated farming. And then Egypt takes a very different turn from Sumar. Sumar, you move from villages to, to towns to cities quite rapidly. Egypt has a series of village communities linked by the Nile, some 600 miles in length. Uh, it has a sort of homogeneous sense of itself. The population, whatever their origins were, thought of themselves as Egyptians as a single unique race and all of a sudden in 3100 BC they jump from villages to effectively a kingdom. Uh, the two lands are united uh, by Narma uh, and with that there is the building of a great capital at Memphis, uh, the ancient equivalent of Cairo and from that point on the norm in Egyptian history is unity. You have a kingdom that can move uh, as a single civilization in a way that you never have in Mesopotamia. In Mesopotamia, it's a constant struggle to unite and create territorial empires. You need to build bureaucracies, legal systems, armies. In early Egypt, you don't have that problem. The pharaoh is put at the center of the civilization as a god king. And clearly, by Dynasty three. And the, the history of uh, Egypt is uh, arranged by dynasties, by the Old Kingdom. They are clearly gods, uh, living gods, who can consolidate uh, the various cults and rituals and undertake the unbelievable building programs of the pyramids. Uh, this order breaks up because of imperial uh, internal reasons. But Egypt is then reassembled in a Middle Kingdom, which in many ways represents a... Um, uh, a um, Improvement on the uh, ruling of the pharaohs through bureaucratic institutions. You get the first imperial expansion, particularly in uh, the northern Sudan in what is called Nubia. Uh, and this order is uh, toppled by an outside invasion, the Hyksos. And while the Hyksos bring an end to the Middle Kingdom, it simply galvanizes the Egyptian populations in the upper or southern uh, part of Egypt to drive out the Hyksos and recreate the imperial order of Egypt, uh, which then goes out and launches an incredible uh, period of expansion and creates an empire in Asia. So when you look at um, the narrative of Egyptian history, you see a pattern similar initially to what you had in Mesopotamia, but the creation of this unified, homogeneous civilization, which has a real sense of itself and always can assimilate outsiders. Uh, it too saw um, the triumphs in farming. Uh, one of the significant points about the plants and animals in the Nile Valley, they had brought, been brought in by uh, people from the Middle East at some point, very early. Cattle, sheep, barley, wheat, 
had probably been domesticated in what is now southeastern Turkey and the Levant. And at the time, it was easy to cross the Sinai. There's constant movement back and forth across the Sinai. And by 3100 BC, uh, these animals and domesticated plants had long been established in the Nile Valley. Uh, I show the Narmar palette uh, to give you uh, this was a ceremonial symbol that was mounted on a pole uh, for the first pharaoh of Egypt. It shows him wearing the crown of um, Upper Egypt, where he was from, from the south, and then after his triumph, uh, wearing the crown of Lower Egypt. And they always thought of the pharaoh of the two kingdoms, represented by two goddesses in iconography and a unified realm. Uh, the Pharaohs, of course, had, uh, by the Third Dynasty, had been so closely associated with the gods. We use the term Pharaoh, which is a Hebrew rendition of he who dwells in the great house. You generally didn't use the name of the Pharaoh because it was too sacred. He actually had five different names that you use in different rituals. And uh, as all Egyptians eventually were conceived to have, he had a spark of life, uh, a personality uh, within the body, uh, and this is what the ka is what one enjoin the gods. The ba is what rests in the tomb. And for the two to interact in the other world, you must maintain the ba in the tomb. And when you destroy the ba, you essentially destroy the ka. Uh, and that's the whole purpose of pyramids, is to provide the proper royal burial. Uh, the pharaoh was also associated with the attributes of the god Ptah, the god of wisdom, intelligence, um, authoritative word. The pharaoh word, the pharaoh speaks, law takes place. Um, the law is ordered. Just as in what little we have of a creation myths of Egypt, there's a constant uh, notion of an eternal order. Once the gods conceive and speak of it, it comes to be. The same powers are attributed to the pharaoh. And above all, ma'at and justice, which becomes one of the great attributes of pharaohs, um, especially in the Middle Kingdom. So this is the um, intellectual and religious beliefs behind the construction of the Great Pyramids, which are one of the great architectural triumphs of the early, um, of really anywhere on the globe. Uh, it is a massive construction. Uh, these are the Pyramids of Giza, uh, along with uh, additional complexes. And you have to realize that the, that the, the main tomb was part of a whole complex of subsidiary tunes and temples and rites that continued to be performed uh, to the pharaoh uh, after his death. There was a third river valley civilization which they're still studying. And that is um, sometimes called the Indus Valley Civilization. Um, I like to call it Malua. That was the name apparently given to it by people from Mesopotamia who traded with it. Uh, archaeology has now demonstrated a similar pattern. Uh, early origins of urbanism with uh, villages, domestication of animals, moving into high civilization and trade, and some kind of literacy. Unfortunately, there's less than 2,000 of these stamped seals and inscriptions. We don't know what language they spoke and we can't read the tablets. Uh, we're in the dark. Uh, there's been a number of proposals. Best guess is it's somehow related to Dravidian languages of South India today. Uh, it peaks at approximately the time of the Middle Bronze Age, contemporary with uh, Middle Kingdom, uh, Old Kingdom, Middle Kingdom e Egypt, with um, uh, the Akkadian Empire and the uh, Sumerian Empires. Uh, it goes into what we think is a decline. And clearly, this civilization was never a single political unit. Those of you familiar with Indian history know that there's two great river valley systems. One is the Ganges, the other is the Indus. And very rarely in Indian history have they been united in a great imperial order. It's only very late um, that that unity really comes uh, to be effective with the Mughals and then the British Raj. And the, um, the suspicion is that this area was the this, this civilization was always, always broken up into a series of political orders, and we really can't understand how did, it, how did urbanism just decline and fall apart uh, over this long period. And it is in that period that the ancestors of the people who brought Sanskrit, and we use the term Indo-Aryan uh, to describe them, uh, migrated into uh, India and eventually will revive literate urban civilization 
It'll be an alphabetic system. It'll be a very different religious system as far as we can tell. Uh, we call it uh, Vedic India or the, um, the Arya Varta, that is uh, the notions of caste. And that will come to define Indian civilization um, and its connection with this earlier urban civilization is still considerably under, uh, underway in, in study. I uh, will be glad to talk about that more individually with people of what my thoughts are. It's, it's quite controversial. And again, it's complicated by the fact that we can't read anything. We cannot read that script, which um, uh, would provide at least some information. And what, what we have is probably um, uh, inventories and ownership seals. Um, we don't have continuous texts. And I suspect they existed, but they were written probably on palm paper. Has anyone ever seen that? I'm just curious. It was, have you in India? <coughs> it's, it's, it's very commonly used in India before the advent of paper under the Mughals. And it's incredibly fragile. I've seen it on various occasions. It, it, it doesn't hold up well, particularly in, in tropical climates. It just disintegrates. My suspicion is the records were kept on something like that. And that's why they haven't come down to us. Uh, it was not an illiterate civilization. It's just that the writing hasn't survived. Um, here's an idea of the scope of where, uh, what it covers. It covers the Indus. It now, uh, excavations have shown that Gujarat was included, and particularly the upper Ganges and the region between the upper Ganges and the, um, uh, the land of the five rivers, the, that is the great tributaries of the uh, Indus, the Punjab, and that region is known as the Doab, the D-O-A-B. Uh, this is the cockpit of Indian civilization, and in the later period, it uh, seems to have broken up. Uh, here's an example of the building at uh, one of their major sites, Mahinjadaro, and uh, examples of the writing I spoke of, as well as one of the few cult statues that have come of apparently a priest king. Uh, it clearly breaks up into differentiated material cultures. What this represents linguistically and politically, we don't know. And eventually, it is replaced by a new order uh, in the early Iron Age, which shifts the whole balance into the Ganges and the Doab. And that is to be associated with the arrival of the Indo-Aryans and the bringing of the language that evolves into classic Sanskrit and the traditions of India we have today, including caste. Um, those are our three river valley civilizations. In the Near East, I mentioned briefly at the start of this lecture that it is the first river valley civilization that seems to have the greatest influence in extending urban literate culture. Um, this is very true in the Levant. There have been important excavations at Ebla and Ugarit, which is today in Syria. Uh, we have a variety of people, Hurrians, Canaanites, Amorites. The, the second two are um, uh, our uh, Semitic speakers, the Hurrians speak a language that has no relationship, but again, because of grammars and dictionaries, we're able to read this. And the Ugarit um, fellows are very important because they begin to simplify the cuneiform writing system into a syllabary. That is moving from 700 to 800 symbols to down to around 90 to 100. Uh, and this is, again, for record keeping. Ugarit is on the Mediterranean. It's in trade with Egypt. It's on the routes leading to lower Mesopotamia. It's uh, in contact with Asia Minor. Uh, Ebla is farther inland. This was a major site in the Bronze Age and one of the first cities in Syria to attain high literate civilization. It was excavated by the Italians starting in the 1960s. Uh, both of these sites have verified that in the Middle Bronze Age period, we see the extension of literate urban civilization. Uh, the other area that's also brought into this orbit is the Aegean world. Um, the origins of Greek civilization, that includes the Minoan civilization on Crete, which sees the development of a syllabary. And what is important with Crete, the first significant development of seaborne commerce. Uh, in Minoan Crete is born the, uh, essentially the Mediterranean uh, seaborne tr uh, trade. Uh, these are the people who set some of the basic fundamentals of later Greek civilization, and they transmit their cultural heritage to newcomers in the mainland, Greek speakers, who are believed to arrive somewhere between 2000 and 1900 BC, and that leads to the development of palaces on the mainland. Um, 
the creation of a new writing system. And these Greeks, sometimes called Achaeans or Mycenaeans, take over Minoan Crete and then begin to expand their commerce uh, through the Mediterranean world. Uh, and the archaeological evidence shows these early Greeks active in a wide circle. This is the original trade cultural zone of Canossus, the capital of Minoan Crete. And that is then, um, it, you can see the sailing distances here to give you how easy it is to sail around. And, um, and that becomes the, um, the basis for um, the Mediterranean trade, which rests on dry uh, farming techniques. Unlike the river valley civilizations in the Mediterranean world, um, you cultivate the olive, the vine, and grains. These are intercultivated, and you depend on winter rains to nourish the grains. The grains uh, are then harvested in May and June, depending on conditions. It is very different. You don't have the kind of pooling of labor in the Indus Valley, in Sumar, in Egypt, and you get a very, very different pattern of villages and agriculture. That type of farming, in order to sustain the palaces you see in Bronze Age Greece, requires the development of seaborne commerce. Um, some of our earliest depictions of ships in the Mediterranean come from Minoan civilization. Uh, this is from Akrotiri on the island of Thera. Uh, Santorini is what it's called today. Has anyone ever been there? Uh, have you? Um, it, was a, it was a volcano that blew up around 1550 or 1600 BC and sank about three quarters of the island. And on it was a Minoan colony. Uh, it's, it's only about a sailing, a little over a day sailing from Canossus, uh, from Crete. And the result was the burial of a, 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 a Minoan settlement with all these marvelous frescoes that show already a great variety of ships, uh, warships, commercial ships, that were available to the Minoans of Crete that gave them the, um, their so-called thalassocracy or sea power uh, in the Aegean, which was then extended by the Greeks who came in and took over this civilization. Two things should be kept in mind. There are two scripts, linear A, linear B. The Minoans invented the writing because they developed cities and seaborne commerce. By 2100 BC, they have a, a writing system. It's probably a syllabary, and it was probably inspired by writing systems that you had in the Levant, in Syria. That writing system was then taken over by the newcomers of the mainland who were Greek speakers. That's called Linear B. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with it. That was deciphered back in 1953 by a man named Michael Ventris, uh, a British cryptologist in the Second World War, who assumed that the syllables represented Greek va uh, values, substituted in based on the way he broke German codes in the Second World War, and presto, linear B is Greek. It is a form of Greek that eventually evolved into what we call East Greek or Ionic Greek uh, in the Classical Age. And so the um, Minoans, in effect, taught the people who eventually would be the ancestors of the classical Greeks, writing, seaborne commerce, and that close contact with the Near East. Looking at early Bronze Age civilization in Greece is actually looking at an adaptation and extension of civilization of the Near East. And in many ways, its social values, its organization of society, wouldn't be that too different from, say, Babylon. It would be much smaller, it wouldn't be as impressive, but we suspect that the structures of kings, uh, the bureaucracies, the warriors that supported these monarchies um, would be similar. The difference was it was built on seaborne commerce and naval power. Uh, these are examples of the writings that have come down to us, Linear B. This is a stirrup jar that's used to export um, perfumed oil. And the Minoans uh, uh, really uh, pioneered the idea of importing raw materials, metals, cottons, um, or um, ivories, and exporting high finished premium goods. That's clearly what's going on uh, um, in the trade connections. Um, this gives you an idea of the extent of the networks uh, by the Middle Bronze Age, by 1500 BC. Um, Greek trade uh, has extended all the way to the Western Med, is very, very closely linked to what's going on in the Near East. And as I say, there's considerable influence coming in from Egypt and from the cities of the Levant. 
These early Greeks are also clashing with the Hittite Empire, we'll get to in a minute, that organizes the first great state in Asia Minor. In Asia Minor, um, if anyone has traveled to the plateau of Turkey uh, today, Anatolia as it's called, um, civilization develops much later uh, with the arrival of the speakers of languages that lead to classic Hittite. And it very much depends on trade contacts with Mesopotamia. Um, I showed you one of the early cuneiform tablets from Kultepe. And starting from 1600 BC down to 1200 BC, a series of kings unite the Anatolian plateau and build up an imperial order which has got maybe a third of the population as Egypt and is able to fight the Egyptian pharaohs to a standstill. It is a remarkable case of organization. This is what the Hittite Empire looks like at its greatest height. It covers this area. Largely, it is a collection of vassal kings, and it could be understood in two ways. First, it has taken the civilization of the Near East and transplanted it and, and fused it to create a new urban civilization in Asia Minor for the first time. And second, its political power rested in bringing the areas of Western and Southern Asia Minor under control and then marching these vassals and allies into the Near East to conquer the more civilized areas of Mesopotamia and Syria. That ran them head on into the Egyptian Empire. This is an example of the citadel at Hutushas, the great capital. Uh, excavations prove it was now a ritual city, the massive wall constructions have been reconstructed by the German team. And uh, it is a city of numerous temples. And the way the Hittite monarch kept power is to relocate all the cults of this diverse empire of vassal states within the great uh, capital, Hattushas, today known as Boaskoy in Turkish, or Boaskale as they elevated the term. And um, above all, uh, the great uh, chambers at Yazalakaya, which are the funerary um, burials of the late Hittite kings, showing all the gods in procession, and the king in the company of the gods. Uh, this is the god Sharuma. And it is believed that the Hittite monarchs had amassed enough power and wealth within Asia Minor to try to approximate the kind of power the pharaoh in Egypt had. They were in competition with the Egyptian empire. Uh, this is what the political order looks like by the Middle Bronze Age, a Hittite empire extending its control to the west, to the southeast, an Egyptian empire that expelled its invaders and has taken over much of the Levant, and the main clashes are between the Hittites and the Egyptians, and those clashes probably contribute to the collapse of the Bronze Age imperial order. Um, this is just a quick chronology for later Egypt. And this is what most of your students are familiar with outside of the pyramids. Um, Queen Hatshepsut, the first ruler we know of to rule in her own right, a female, as pharaoh. Tutmos III, often called the Napoleon of the Near East. Uh, my favorite uh, wacky pharaoh, Eknaten. Did he pervert or did he actually represent the epitome of uh, pharaonic power, uh, a solar monotheist. And of course, Ramesses II, noted for his very long reign and his ability to put his name on everyone's previous monuments to exalt himself. Um, um, one of the great PR pharaohs of all time. Uh, here's an example of Hatshepsut with feminine features, but here she is represented as pharaoh with the ritual beard. Uh, she ruled as pharaoh. That represented an achievement of Egyptian civilization that she had the dynastic credentials and the bureaucracy and army behind her to rule effectively as pharaoh, a testimony to the sophistication and success of the Egyptian imperial order. Um, this Egyptian imperial order takes quite a different change from earlier orders in Egypt of the Middle and uh, Old Kingdom. Uh, the pharaoh is represented in combat frequently. Here's Tutmos III smiting the Asiatics at Megiddo. It also sees a religious revolution by the pharaoh Eknaten, who uh, abolished the cults in year two and worshipped uh, the sun as the sole god in a solar monotheism that represented a veritable religious revolution 
and resulted in a um, construction of a new capital um, at the modern site of Tel Armana and the neglect of the empire, as it turned out, because while the pharaoh is busy with his religious reforms, the Hittites are gobbling up um, Egyptian Syria. Uh, the failure of that monotheistic uh, creed leads to the restoration of an effective dynasty 18, uh, 19 and Ramesses II, who is able to recover part of the empire uh, from the Hittites. And the two imperial orders sign a remarkable treaty in uh, 1257 BC. Um, it is a treaty that recognizes the territorial boundaries. And if you go to the UN today, you will see a copy of it in front of the uh, UN building uh, because it was a regulation uh, re representing the reality that the Hittites controlled this region, the pharaoh this region, and that the cost of war was such that it was worthwhile to the two imperial orders to come to a diplomatic solution and essentially create ways of working out disputes rather than just going to war. It is a remarkable achievement for the late Bronze Age. Uh, there are scholars who are now working on the kind of diplomatic correspondence that went on in the late Bronze Age. And uh, there are several books that can be recommended on that topic right now. Uh, one of them is a book that came out recently known as The Brother Kings, which I highly recommend as an introduction. This order uh, broke up. Uh, again, uh, it's still under reconsideration. This brought to an end the first period of ancient history, that is the Bronze Age. Uh, it seized migrations out of the Balkans that disrupt the Hittite Empire. It seized, mig it seized migrations into the Greek world that triggers people pushing out of the Greek world to the shores of the Levant, shattering Egyptian control of the Levant. Uh, peoples in Libya today uh, also uh, get involved in this movement to move into the Nile Valley. And what happens is the great imperial orders disappear. And in the regions where civilization had been extended in the Middle and Late Bronze Age, in Asia Minor, in Greece, in the Levant, not only is there a breakdown in urban civilization, there's a loss of literacy. In Egypt and southern Mesopotamia, they lose their empires but they retain the cities and literacy. Their cuneiform systems hold out, uh, or hieroglyphics. There is continuity across the Bronze Age into the Iron Age. But in all these other areas, there's a disruption and break in continuity. And you can essentially really trace the changes based on who uses an alphabet and who doesn't. Those using alphabetic systems got the worst of the Bronze Age collapse. Those that retained the older writing systems got through culturally. Uh, and that's a simplified way of looking at what happened to the first period of ancient history. Um, there's a lot of theories about why it took place. Uh, one of them is changes in military technology. That is, the great imperial orders depended on great chariot armies that proved very expensive. Uh, to supplement it, they began to hire uh, different types of frontier peoples who had superior fighting skills and weapons. Um, examples of this are shown by the new types of slashing swords, open order tactics that negated chariot armies. And one, ar one argument is that, and again, uh, it's only part of the explanation in my opinion, it's the same thing that happened with the Roman Empire. You use the frontier peoples who are a mix of your own peoples and barbarians to take on defense and eventually the frontier goes into business for itself. Uh, that's clearly what happens in the Roman Empire in the 5th century AD, at least the Western Empire. We suspect that was one of the events going on in the Bronze Age. Another would be if we knew what the finances were to maintain the expensive monarchies, buildings, ceremonial costs, military costs. There's been speculation on climate change. There's been speculation on demographics. It's still, an, it's still an issue under study. But a number of factors came together that undermined those early urban literate civilizations and created a very new order in the Near East. Um, in the Levant, we see the emergence of three new important peoples, Phoenicians, Aramaeans, and Hebrews. Um, these are Semitic speakers. Phoenicians, well known for creating the alphabet and also for conducting uh, the reopening of the Mediterranean trade routes that had collapsed and the establishment of colonies in the Western Med. The Aramaeans brought in the camel, the development of caravan trades, 
But above all, the Hebrews emerge as the, uh, the two kingdoms of Israel and Ju uh, Judah, uh, which sees the development of Jewish monotheism. And it's a whole um, uh, interesting question in itself. How do we go from Hebrews to Jews? That is, how do you go from a religion that was associated with an ethnic group in a specific area to a religion, a monotheism, that is detached from its area and can be worshipped anywhere? Uh, um, this is a breakdown of uh, what Christians would call the Old Testament. Um, and it, it really sees a codification of these traditions in the late Iron Age and, above all, the Babylonian captivity. The capture of the city by King Nebuchadnezzar and the deportation of the, um, the Jewish literate upper classes to Babylon who put these traditions together and stress the monotheistic worship of Yahweh uh, and you move essentially from the worship of the temple to the worship of the synagogue. Of course, they're later restored by Cyrus the Great, and that sees the codification and development of Hebrew text. Judaism is born. So those are three of the new peoples that come out of the collapse of the Bronze Age. The other are a series of imperial orders. The Assyrian Empire, the first and most successful, um, gets a bad rep. They were brutal and bloodthirsty in many ways, but they're also very successful. And they're the first imperial order in the Near East in over four centuries. Um, they set many of the institutions that allow you to build later empires that follow, the Neo-Babylonian, the ones that knocked over um, Judah, and above all, the Persian Empire, which is the great summation of Near Eastern empires. By 500 BC, all of the river valleys, the Indus, the Tigris-Euphrates, the Nile, are in the hands of a single great king of Persia. It is organized into a series of provinces and satrapies that represents one of the most successful Middle Eastern orders that we've seen today. And in many ways, the basis for the later Sassanid uh, Empire and the various Muslim caliphates to follow. Um, this is the um, uh, imperial result of the breakdown of the Bronze Age. Um, this is an example from Persepolis of the great king receiving tribute. There was, however, another civilization that comes up, and that's Greece. Um, the Greek world is divided into two axes. One is the Peloponnesus here on central Greece that looks west. The other is Athens in the Aegean, which looks north and southeast. If you keep that in mind, you have the dichotomy of Sparta and Athens right there, represented in its economic and cultural divisions. I'll talk more about the Greek state at uh, war, but you can basically understand the Greek world from the Bronze Age uh, and the arrival of the first Greek speakers, where it's really part of the Near East. It suffers perhaps the worst of the Dark Age collapse. It reemerges as a new civilization in the so-called Archaic period. It repels a Persian invasion that leads to the Classical Age, the conquest of Alexander, and then the Hellenistic Age. This is the formative period here. The Archaic Age sees the Greeks become Greeks or Hellenes. The Classical Age brings it to its epitome. The Hellenistic Age represents the extension of Greek civilization to the Near East. We call it Hellenistic. Istikos in Greek means like. It's Greek-like. It represents a fusion of Greek and Near Eastern traditions into a new civilization or series of related civilizations. Um, you can see that it's broken up into various dialects and patterns. There was never a united Greek world. And when teaching Greek and Roman history, I always find that with American students at least, Greek history is sometimes a little difficult. You're dealing with the history of many different cities. It's like trying to understand the history of Europe. But when you're studying Roman history, Americans like it. First, the Romans are tacky, obnoxious. We identify, at least I'm from New York, so I identify with that immediately. Um, second is that it starts out small and ends up being really big, which Americans also like. Um, and that's one way of understanding these two classical civilizations that came out of that Bronze Age tradition in the so-called Iron Age or the Classical Age. Uh, the Greeks also, you also must keep in mind that Greek civilization in the Classical period was Mediterranean. It isn't just the modern kingdom of Greece that had spread around the Mediterranean world on all of its shores, with the exception here in North Africa, uh, where 
Phoenicians had settled, Carthage, and in the eastern tip of Sicily, which would lead to a series of wars between Greeks and Carthaginians. The civilization also was rooted in a very different concept of law. Well, let me just dwell on that for a moment. This comes from Demosthenes. The whole life of Athenians, whether they dwell in large state, a polis, or a small one, is governed by, the na by nature. Phusis is the Greek word. And by the laws, nomoi. Laws mean laws passed by the citizens. Of these, nature is something irregular and incalculable and peculiar to each individual. But the laws are something universal, definite, and the same for all. Now nature, if it is evil, often chooses wrong. And that is why you will find men of uh, an evil nature committing errors. But the laws desire what is just and honorable and salutary. They seek for it, and when they find it, they set it forth as a general commandment equal and identical to all. The law is that which all men ought to believe in many respects, but above all, because every law is an invention and gift of the gods. Well, the same you would find in Hammurabi's code. A tenant of wise men. A bit contradictory to the first, but Demosthenes is a um, politician, not a philosopher. Uh, he's trying to win a legal case with this oration. And a correction of errors, voluntary and involuntary. Very new, interesting concept. And a general covenant of the whole state in accordance which all men in that state ought to regulate their lives. For there are two objects, men of Athens, for which all laws are framed. To deter any man from doing what is wrong, and by punishing the transgressor, to make the rest better men. This is a change. Greek civilization has emerged with civic traditions. That's what marks it different from its Near Eastern tradition. And it's what sets in motion the intellectual thoughts of Western civilization down to today. Um, you can just read the Code of Hammurabi in, in, as a juxtaposition in which law is uh, issued by Hammurabi as a justice, as the gift of the gods. It's an interesting comparison to make. And you can draw many others. The result is Greeks do not organize as monarchies. They do not have bureaucracies and professional armies. In fact, they are saved by their poverty. Um, they evolve into a executive branches from a very weak king a council, and the so-called assembly of citizens who vote. And this leads into different types of governments, of aristocracy, oligarchy, democracy, and eventually democracy. Uh, the city-state is known as a polis, which is more than just a city and an economic center. It is also a political community by which the Greeks identify themselves. And in many ways, we look at Greek civilization and its cultural achievements, and we feel a kinship. But in two ways, it's it, one very profound way, actually. It's very distinct. Citizenship ultimately remained that of birth. You could not become a citizenship by naturalization. That would be a Roman concept. And the result would be you get the emergence of alliance structures, uh, the Peloponnesian League and the Athenian League, the Delian League, the Athenian Empire I'll talk about in greater detail. And those two leagues go at it to struggle for the hegemony of Greece, and they cannot expand their citizenship. And the result is the Greek cities fall under the control of the Macedonian kings. And the Macedonian kings will then take the resources of Greece and their kingdom under the genius of Alexander the Great, and in six years conquer the Persian Empire in one of the most spectacular set of commands, uh, uh, battles and um, one of the greatest commanders of all time and open to the Near East now to Greek civilization. His successors who divided up the empire sponsored Greek cities across the Near East and resulted in the construction of Hellenic cities. Here's an example coming from what is now in Afghanistan, excavated by a French team. And it reverses the relationship of the Greek world to the Near East. Up until Alexander, the Greek world is receiving so much from the Near East. After Alexander, the trend is in the other direction. Although you have to stress, there's a great deal of interaction and fusion between the Greeks and the indigenous populations of the Near East. That brings us to the Greek world. And I have gone on a bit 
too long about these early civilizations, but let me just quickly orient you on the Roman world. Uh, uh, there's two things you need to know about the Roman Republic. First, its constitutional developments. It is extraordinary in that it evolved concepts beyond the Greek world where citizenship can be extended. You can assimilate people to the Romans. Our republic is based ultimately on a Roman model. Naturalization would make sense to the Romans. It doesn't make sense to the Greeks. And that allowed the Romans to think of citizenship. Here's an example of Roman Italy at the beginning of at the uh, be, just before the Romans begin to uh, move overseas. There is Roman territory of full Romans. There are people with Latin status who have sort of an intermediate citizenship. They are independent, but they speak Latin. They're regarded as kindred people. Uh, some, some people claim they're the Canadians of the Roman Republic. Um, the other is a various Italian allies, Sokii. And here you have Roman citizens, uh, some without the suffrage, that's a special category, Latin allies, Italian allies. Based on their own counting, this is the military manpower they are capable of mobilizing in 226 BC, 800,000 men. A Greek city-state is lucky if it has 5,000. Most great empires uh, fielding armies run 35, 40,000. The Romans can put on the battlefield some 800,000 trained men. Now, they can't do it all the time. The Roman Republic is remarkable. It has all of the civic patriotism we associate with Greek city-states and we associate with later Italian city-states in Italy, but it has the, the power of a bureaucratic Near Eastern monarchy. And that is because the Romans, not through any brilliant philosophical conclusion, by the practical need that they needed to supplement their citizen power, were able to think of handing out citizenship and alliances in bits and pieces and eventually assimilating people into the Roman body politic. And that would ultimately end in a, a decree in 212 AD in the Roman Empire when citizenship is extended to all free residents of the Roman world. If you spoke Latin, wore a toga, and thought Roman, you are now Roman. And that becomes a marked feature of Roman civilization, which often makes it very attractive to Americans to study. Uh, the result of this manpower is awesome. The Romans are able to conquer the Mediterranean world in the late Republic. This just gives you a sense of mobilization figures. And ends up uniting the Mediterranean world for the first and only time. And uh, it leads to enormous amount of wealth importation of, um, you can see the growth in the population of the city of Rome, the development of a slave society in South Italy of all these um, conquered peoples to develop commercial farming. Uh, it leads to a breakdown of the Roman Republic. Uh, first, a series of reforms attempting to reform the state from 133 to 91 that fail. And then finally, a series of civil wars that leads to the emergence of great commanders known as imperators, Marius, Sulla, Pompey, Caesar, and ultimately Caesar's heir, Octavian, and the creation of a Roman monarchy. That monarchy, the Principate, however, is very peculiar. It is a monarchy, here's the Roman Empire, it's at height, which is still a republic. And it is one of the strangest monarchies on record because the Roman emperor is not a king by law. He holds a series of powers that enables him to get things done, to maintain a professional army on the frontiers, to preside over an economic boom in the Mediterranean world that would have no equal until really the 18th and 19th century. But in the end, he was a magistrate. And he had to conduct himself as a magistrate. And the upper classes that wrote the histories and the literature that have come down to us uh, for the first two centuries of the Roman Empire essentially hated the monarchy and nostalgically looked back to the Republic. And in a strange way, that civic ideal was passed from the Roman Empire to later European civilization. Um, my time is running out, and I would like to just close with this anecdote of what the Roman Emperor is like. There's a story that's told of the Emperor Marcus Aurelius. Uh, any of you have seen the movie Gladiator? Um, he is the, um, the good emperor at the start. Um, who's the British actor who plays him? I forget. Richard, um, it'll come to me. Richard Harris. And um, he, um, 
is done in by his uh, evil son, Com uh, uh, Commodus, uh, and the movie proceeds from there. Um, it's, it's all fictional. Marcus Aurelius probably died of natural causes, but his son was an unworthy heir. Marcus Aurelius styled himself as a philosopher, and he very much believed that the emperor should rule in this tradition by example, not by, by, by command. That you still paid homage to those civic traditions, at least for the ruling classes. And the story is told of him riding on a country road in Italy, and an Italian peasant woman flags him down with a petition. Emperor, emperor, I have a petition. And Marcus Aurelius says, I'm too busy. And she yells back, stop being emperor. And Marcus Aurelius stops, gets off, sits under a tree, and in his capacity as a tribune of the plebeians, that is a magistrate uh, with um, legislative powers, says, citizen, what is your complaint? And that is the essence of the, late Ro of the Roman monarchy and a good point to end this rundown through the ancient world. So,